Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Enzo Kunanen, and I am the uh, social media rep for the Oxford University History Society. Today, we are very proud and honored to have uh, Professor Matthew Restall from uh, Pennsylvania State University here to talk with us today. Uh, he he is the Edwin Earl Sparks Professor of History and Anthropology and the Director of Latin American Studies at Penn State. And he uh, was educated at the universities of Oxford and California and has written over 30 books and 80 articles and essays on Mayan history, the Spanish conquest, indigenous and African experiences in Spanish Amer America and popular music. His talk today will be on, whether, on the indigenous history of the Spanish American invasions. Uh, just a reminder, we will, we would uh we just be uh just put just meet yourselves uh while while uh professor restel is talking and there will be time for questions at the end and we are also recording this so without further ado i'll turn it over to professor restel thank you so much enzo and jacob thank you for inviting me to talk to you um i do have a text which I'm going to read more or less from, and I put together a PowerPoint with a lot of images, and I'll be talking off the images. Um, there should be plenty of time within the hour for feedback, so uh, I I would do encourage you to um, have questions for me at the end. Um, and just a tech question, Enzo, when I see that someone's in the waiting room, I'm not the one that has to admit them, right? You also have control. I can admit I can yeah, I can admit them. I'll Don't just worry. Ignore, okay. I've started admitting people and I was like, wait a minute, am I supposed to be? Yeah. It's not really quite my okay. All right. <clears throat> Let me um move now towards towards uh sharing my screen. Okay, and does that look does that all look correct? Enzo? Yeah, excellent. Okay. Uh, so, conquerors control narratives. This we know. And yet, in the case of the Spanish conquest, we have for five centuries accepted without question the narrative that the conquerors created. Even that label, the Spanish conquest, and the labels nested within it, such as the conquest of Mexico, privileged the narrative of the conquerors, or rather, of the invaders, as any real revisionist approach to this history must begin with a rethinking of its core terminology. Why have we accepted that traditional narrative for so long? What was the narrative of those invaders? You know it, of course, all of you, even if you think you don't. That's how powerful and deep-rooted the story is. What really happened in those much fabled years? Is it possible to decolonize this history and to create a more balanced understanding, a new history, if not an indigenous history of what happened five centuries ago in the Americas? In the next half hour or so, I shall be talking about events that occurred in many regions of the Americas, almost all in the, in the early 16th century, but my focus will be on Mexico and the invasion war there of 1519 to 21, partly because that was the focus of my most recent books on the Spanish American invasions, but also because this is a vast history and Mexico offers some usefully stark examples of the points to be argued. But this is, this is the book plugging part. Um, but of course, there's also a larger history, which I've been attempting to engage um, for about 25 years now. Um, so there'll be some non-Mexican references as well. Um, and mostly those will come from the Maya area, because that's what I um, have written on before as well. Here's a map that I drew for one of my books. There was a time when I drew my own maps. I thought they were kind of like Captain Crunch maps from a cereal box or something, but press editors seem to, to like them for a while. Um, and this is just to help orient you um, to a geography that you probably know to some extent. When I talk about the Aztec Empire, it's this part here, which I've rendered like kind of like a rash rather unfortunately. Um, and then when I refer to the Maya area, it's this area here, and I make a, just a few passing references to Highland Guatemala down here and then northern 
northern Yucatan up here. Um, I'm not going to remind you of the narrative that was created by the conquistadors, at least not by giving you a detailed recounting of it. Um, that would take hours. I don't have time for that. But also I fear it would have a counterproductive confirmation bias effect. In other words, it would just sound too true. And, and as you'll see when I get to going through the structure of my of my talk, um, I'm run, I do run the risk of telling you things which I'm going to then tell you are wrong. But in the meantime, the risk is that you become convinced of them. I, and I've written in a couple of my books about the narcotic effect of Cortez's so-called letters or letters to the king and the traditional narrative drawn in part upon those misused propaganda reports, um, and that can have a similar kind of effect. Anyway, instead, what I'm going to do is identify 10 key elements of the narrative established by the invaders, their promoters, and the royal chroniclers of the early modern era. And again, I'm leaning heavily on Mexican examples. So I'm going to go through num these numbered points, one through 10. And the first time I go through the 10, I'm going to be giving you a particular perspective on the traditional narrative. And then I'm going to go back and give the same one through 10 and essentially kind of attack myself and undermine as much as possible um, everything that I've that I've already said. So number one, school children and college students worldwide are still taught what the conquistadors asserted in their official reports and what written and visual histories affirmed ever since, that the Spanish conquest was a remarkable achievement one of the greatest military exploits in human history. The so-called conquest of Mexico has been highlighted as the exemplar of that achievement, as the rapid and remarkable triumph of a few hundred intrepid adventurers against an empire of millions. Sounds familiar, right? Two, credit for the Spanish conquest has tended to go to a short list of explorers and so-called generals. This begins with Columbus, whether he's being defended as an agent of civilization and divine providence or vilified as the founding father of genocide, slavery and oppression in the Americas, whether he's being apotheosized on Twitter or his statues are being pulled down, he's still credited with everything that happened in his lifetime and beyond. With respect to Spanish conquistadors, the credit tends to follow the boundaries of modern nations. So in the US, Columbus, for complex reasons, but largely to do with modern era Italian migrants, uh, Coronado, and as we see here, De Soto. In Guatemala, it's Pedro de Alvarado. In Peru, Pizarro. And in Mexico, that astonishing victory has been largely, remember, I'm giving you the, the other position I'm going to argue against, right? And that astonishing victory has been largely credited to the military genius of one of history's great generals, Hernan Cortez or Cortez. So here they are, right? The, uh, the great white men who did it all, apparently, built the empire. Now I'm being sarcastic, so I'm already going against my argument. I just, it's hard to resist. Okay, that was point two. Point three, the success of Spanish conquistadors such as Pizarro and Cortes has been traditionally contrasted with the failure in leadership of indigenous rulers. Such rulers have been depicted as divided among themselves, too weak or blind or barbaric to see how disunity condemns them to defeat. And here, I, as I'm talking, I know you have to like somehow listen to me and look at the images as well. But uh, this is what's this is what was presented to ch to children in Mexico in the early 20th century. These wonderful little books, um, just the covers alone, convey so much of the of the conventional narrative and kind of the, the, how it had evolved by the time we get to the end of the 19th century. We can see the. Um, it's it's a sympathetic but nevertheless very negative view there of of Montezuma on the right. Um, the existence of at least two small kingdoms, two 
sorry, the existence of at least two dozen small kingdoms among the Maya, for example, instead of a centralized empire, has been viewed as a symptom of leadership failure and civilizational weakness. After all, Maya civilization had centuries earlier collapsed, right? This is what people believe. Absolutely categorically not true. This is what people believe. No wonder then that Pedro de Alvarado, for example, was able to play the Quiche Maya and Cacchiquel Maya against each other, thereby forging a colonial province in Highland Guatemala. And no wonder that Pizarro and his partner Almagro were able to use Atahualpa and his brother Huascar as weapons against each other, thereby crushing the great Inca empire with a mere 168 Spanish men. As for the Aztec emperor, Montezuma, his superstitious weakness condemned him to surrendering to Cortes without a fight, so the story goes. He did what no European would have done, simply welcoming the invader into his capital city, handing over the keys to his kingdom. Point four. Throughout the centuries of Western imperialism, from the 16th to the 20th, stories were repeated of European explorers and conquerors being taken for gods by those whose lands they discovered. This has for long been a much treasured trope. The belief, for example, that indigenous Mexicans viewed Spanish newcomers as divine helped support the assertion, not only that Montezuma surrendered, but that he did so because he believed that the Spanish arrival fulfilled an ancient prophecy that made the Spanish king, with Cortes as his representative, the legitimate ruler of Mexico. The fact that this is a topic of recent books reflects how long we have believed that non-Europeans believed European explorers and conquerors were gods. And you might be thinking, well, this is a, this is a straw man point. This is ridiculous. It's, it, is a, it's, it is amazing how deeply rooted is rooted it is um, and how much it is still believed there's a brand new book that's coming out from uh, Cambridge University Press which is a whole book length uh, study of this just one particular topic and it's an important book that needs to be written and here we are in 2022 right so it seemed like we should have we should be way beyond a point like this but we're, we're still not point number five Montezuma's surrender meant that subsequent Aztec resistance was a rebellion. So the traditional narrative goes. This was merely the most famous, exa famous example of a phenomenon that occurred almost everywhere that Spaniards went in the Americas. Indigenous leaders surrendered, often converting to Christianity, but then, due to their inherently duplicitous nature, and the ease with which they were manipulated by the devil, they rebelled. This is how the story was written down. Six. Everybody loves this topic. And it's one of the most problematic. So, supposedly, the conquistadors tell us, and we still see in books like Angry Aztecs, which as far as I can tell is the best-selling book in the English language in the world on, on the Aztecs. The Aztecs were bloodthirsty and superstitious, obsessed with human sacrifice, helping to explain why their rebellion was so violent, but also helping to explain why the terrified subject towns of the Aztec empire were so quick to flee Aztec tyranny and embrace the new rulers and new religion. Likewise, the Incas were tyrannical rulers, and thus subject peoples up and down the Andes gratefully welcomed Spanish rule. The same argument was applied for centuries throughout the Americas. To this day, indigenous cultures, such as the ancient Maya, to pick one example, are viewed as having been great sacrifices of humans, including their own children, and cannibalistic too. You can be sure I'll be coming back to that point. That was number six on human sacrifice. Number seven. 
Indigenous peoples often welcomed Spanish invaders, many of them quick to accept conversion and Spanish sovereignty. For example, Cortes can be credited with identifying Tlaxcala as a crucial ally against the Aztecs. Tlaxcala being a central Mexican city-state whose form of government was more like that of ancient Republican Rome in contrast to Aztec tyranny and whose people consequently immediately embraced Christianity. So remember, almost everything that I just said there, I'm going to be arguing against, but that is absolutely a part of the conventional narrative. Um, and here, this map, um, there's Tlaxcala right here. Uh, so you can see this is kind of on the route of the invasion force. Uh, and the traditional narrative story here is Cortes brilliantly identified these um, that this city state that had held out against the Aztecs and was by its very nature different, as I must, must described, and therefore was able to use them as allies to bring about this miraculous destruction of the Aztec Empire. It's all incredibly distorted and wrong. We'll come back to Clash Gala and this and the larger context of what this means for, for number set point number seven in a moment. Number eight. Cortes also continues to this day to be given credit for the identification of an enslaved Nahua woman, soon to be known as Malinche, as a potential interpreter. And also traditionally, to his credit, is her loyalty to Cortes, thereby placing a symbolic romance at the heart of the story of the conquest of Mexico. Indeed, European, not just Spanish settlement throughout the Americas, was a conquest in a benign romantic sense. Powerful, irresistible men seduced the indigenous world with civilization. Remember that one, number eight, I'll be coming back to that with my, with my uh, intellectual knives sharpened. Number nine, the dramatic victory of the Spaniards was also a reflection of the superiority of Western civilization. As manifested in religion and culture, Christianity, alphabetic writing, etc., and or technological advances. I put this slide up here to illustrate ships, guns, steel weapons. So this might seem like a somewhat outdated point. You might think, well, most people surely aren't going around saying, oh, Western civilization was superior. Well, the thing is, actually, they are. Um, but not only that, but often... This point is kind of coded. So whereas hundreds of years ago, Spaniards um, or other Europeans would have put it simply in religious terms. You know, we had we had the true religion. They didn't. That makes us better. Full stop. Um, nowadays, there's uh, the technological advances um, or supposed marks of superiority used kind of as a, as a substitute for that. So. Um, alphabetic writing or writing, which is obviously a point that is wrong and shows a misunderstanding of writing systems in the Americas, um, or guns, for example, which likewise shows a misunderstanding of the nature of guns um, at the time. Uh, this image is obviously not a photograph of what was happening in 1519. And in fact, uh, even though it was created in Mexico, what it what it gives you is a depiction of um, not so much the ships, although to some extent the ships too are wrong, but the armor and the artillery and so on is all late 17th century. This is not from 1519. So, um, you know, this isn't just about uh, um, the, the understanding of this being done, being depicted wrongly in the modern period, because we don't know enough about the 16th century. It's happening all the way back in the early modern period itself. All right. The last one, number 10. Because the conquest was so swift, it soon gave way to the long colonial period. Colonial foundation dates therefore became set in stone, later becoming similarly foundational to modern nation states. Thus, at the end of the siege of the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan in August 1521, that marked the complete collapse of the empire and the foundation of the Spanish colonial kingdom of New Spain. In 2021, Mexico was thus able to celebrate its bicentennial as a nation state and the quincentennial. Okay. That's the traditional narrative. 
Now the second half of the talk, the, the decolonized narrative. Um, let me have a little introduction to this before I get to points one through 10. A reading of the sources that created this traditional narrative from so-called letters of Cortez through to modern accounts based on those sources by historians like William Prescott in the 19th century, Hugh Thomas in the 20th. A reading of those sources lends the narrative the false impression of veracity, but we can see through that story. We can cut its loop of lies if we reread those sources with a critical understanding of the political purpose behind every source. There's also a growing body of indigenous authored sources, visual and written, many in indigenous languages that can problematize the traditional narrative in productive ways. This Maya Kachikel example on the right there. We can apply common sense and skepticism to truth claims that cannot be corroborated by multiple sources. So no account, be it in Spanish or in Nahua, in Latin or in Maya, in English or in Quechua, should be taken on face value. Um, and here, I love this beautiful letter um, that uh, is in the Spanish Imperial Archives in Seville in the Archivo General de Indias, um, written in uh, an amazing Latin uh, by Montezuma's nephew. So, you know, he 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 became not only um, fluent in Spanish, was able to read and write Spanish as well as his own language of Nahuatl, um, but also was taught. Latin by Franciscan friars. And um, he writes this letter. You can imagine when I discovered this when I was doing research for my book, um, when Montezuma met Cortez, uh, I thought, well, are we going to get some kind of interesting new insight here from someone who was uh, a, a, a young boy, who was a teenager during the war, um, and sort of experienced all of these events. But on the other hand, he's writing in Latin to the king of Spain. So how am we going to kind of sort all of this out? And this is a, a classic example of a text which so easily could be taken as, you know, the so-called vision of the vanquished, right? He's Montezuma's nephew. This is going to give us the Aztec perspective. But what does the nephew say? Oh, absolutely Montezuma surrendered immediately. Not only that, but he was waiting. He was waiting for the Spaniards to come because he really wanted to be a Christian. And as soon as they arrived, he's like, I've been waiting for you my whole life. Please please save my soul, convert me to Christianity, um, and so on. So it, in other words, it's wonderful that now scholars are beginning to discover all of these other sources and this great variety of sources, but it doesn't make the work any easier, right? It makes the work more complicated, which actually is the is the beauty and the, and the fun of it. But I just, I thought this is a great example to throw up there first of all, rather than something that's in an indigenous language and seems to match what you might expect would be an indigenous response. Um, and then the other slide here I have is an example of two different Maya um, accounts, the one on the uh, left in Kachika, which I showed a moment ago, and then one on the right in Yucatec Maya, which I um, uh, will mention again a little bit, a little bit further on. So um, continuing my little introduction here, we can place also place 16th century sources, those that established the traditional narrative within the larger context of European imperialism in the Atlantic world. And that includes US imperialism in the Americas and its civilization versus barbarism justifications. There's a lot in that sentence, but what I'm trying to um, allude to there is a lot of material that's in a couple of my recent books in which I'm arguing that we cannot understand what happened in the 16th century without understanding why all through the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries on both sides of the Atlantic, the traditional story of the conquistadors was repeated and repeated and enlarged and made more elaborate and so on. And of course, it's that all of that is to do with that, that history of European imperialism. So by applying these rereadings, another narrative is revealed, one that's less tidy, less reassuring, but more believable and far better supported by evidence. 
It also allows us to see not an or the indigenous history, but numerous indigenous histories. Because the notion of one indigenous perspective is itself a product of the colonialist invention of Indians. Those multiple indigenous histories, however, do have the effect of decolonizing the conquistador narrative, an effort, I might add, that is decades older than the current vogue for the phrase decolonization. Schools or movements of scholarship, such as the new philology, the new conquest history, and so on, many with roots going back as far as the 1970s, have for generations been reconstructing indigenous perspectives. So in this new corrective telling of history, let me get to the 10 points. Number one, Spaniards did not simply conquer. They invaded. And most of those invasions were failures with extremely high mortality rates among the invaded and among, and among the invaders, sorry, and among the invaded too, due to indiscriminate slaughter, mass enslavement, and the spread of disease pandemics. Um, and this is kind of a cheap shot here by using uh, sensationalized engravings in Dutch and English editions of Las Casas' devastation of the, of the Indies. Um, if, if you're not sure why, I think it's a cheap shot. I can come back to this later in the Q&A. In Mexico, for example, the Spanish invasions of 1519 to 21 set off a brutal and messy war within the Aztec Empire, in which hundreds of thousands of indigenous families were torn apart by civil conflict, slaughter, enslavement, and epidemic disease. If there was a conquest, it was not simply Spanish, as the empire centered on Tenochtitlan was not destroyed, but thrown into disarray by internal divisions with 98% of the combatants besieging the capital in 1521 being indigenous. That's right, the Spanish siege of Tenochtitlan resulting in their great victory consisted only 2% of Spaniards. Those indigenous warriors attacking Tenochtitlan included those from the Aztec city-state of Texcoco, which was the second ranked city-state in the empire. The Spanish invasion caused the war, but Spaniards neither controlled it, nor were they the primary active protagonists. Calling it the Spanish conquest is pure propaganda, which was the whole point. Secondly, Hernán Cortés was not Hernán Cortés. He was Hernando or Fernando Cortés. Hernan is a is a kind of a is, an, is a modern abbreviation, whatever. Maybe that's too nitpicky. But he was not a general. That's not nitpicky. Um, there were no generals. The conquistadors were not soldiers in an army. They were armed, but they were armed investors or entrepreneurs, settler colonists, and slave traders. Cortez was one of dozens of captains. And that was the only officer rank. In fact, the only rank at all was captain. It was captain and then people who simply weren't called captain. Cortez exercised very little control over a war in which other Spanish captains pursued their own interests. And they were in turn used by Nahua leaders in pursuit of the interests of their city states. Um, this got too, this is, there's too much going on here for me to be able to talk while you're looking at it, but I'll just kind of take that. I'll take that chance. Um, but it's an example of um, of how the concept of Cortesian control has seeped into absolutely every possible source about this, whether it's a cartoon book for school children, video games, um, some of the latest books by scholars and so on. is this kind of notion that Cortez is at the center of everything. Um, and it's such a hard thing to get around. I, I realize if you pick up my book when Montezuma met Cortez, which is in a way a book arguing that Cortez doesn't matter. And yet he's on the title of the book, he's on the front cover and he's mentioned on almost every page. Um, so, um, it, you know, it's it's kind of this huge monolith that that he and his supporters created that is, is, is very hard to get around. Um, 
moving on to kind of the still on point two, but expanding a little bit out from just Cortez here. The conquest is the achievement of a few empire builders, as you remember that earlier slide, is a post-invasion fiction promoted by conquistador captains for political reasons, conveniently disguising the crucial role played by indigenous warriors or rulers in Mexico, the Maya regions, the Andes, and elsewhere. In Yucatan, for example, Francisco de Montejo was no more in control of the invasion war than Cortes had been in Mexico. It took the Montejos, they were actually three Francisco de Montejos, father, son, and nephew. It took them three separate invasions, 20 years, and tens of thousands of Nahua warriors in order to establish a colony that in the end comprised a mere 20% of the Yucatan Peninsula. And it was Maya rulers of the Pech, Shu, and other ancient dynasties who determined where that colony would sit and even whether it would exist. Um, and I put the cover of my of this book of mine, it's just the first book I wrote on this on this topic, this is pretty old now from 1998, almost none of you um, listening to me were born then, I realize. Um, but the reason I called it Maya Conquistador was because in this in this Maya text here, which is a, the page, there's a page example on the right, there's a Maya ruler who appropriates the word, conquist, Spanish word conquistador. He appropriates the Spanish word Hidalgo as a kind of a level of, of, of nobleman and calls himself, the first noble conquistador in Maya, right? With these Spanish words absorbed in, and then goes on to talk about how uh, in this war, um, he was the one who stepped up to defend his kingdom, um, attacked neighboring kingdoms, made an alliance with the Spanish, not the other way around. He made the alliance in order to um, secure the future of his dynasty and, and, and his kingdom. So highly local perspective that it's completely missing from the traditional narrative, uh, but it, so it's not just to correct it, but it also helps us to understand and explain what happened. It just makes so much more sense than the idea of a few hundred Spaniards achieving miracles. Okay, point three. Bold, simple lies repeated endlessly tend to be the best ones. Brexit is best for Britain. Biden stole the election. Montezuma surrendered to Cortez. Yes, I deliberately picked modern examples that are controversial, but that's the whole point, right? Examples where millions of people would say, yeah, that's the most outrageous lie ever. And millions will say, that's not a lie at all. That's the point. Montezuma surrendered to Cortez. Oh. No matter that the evidence overwhelmingly proves the opposite. For according to the rules of both evidence and common sense, Montezuma never surrendered to Cortes or to any Spaniard. Indeed, he hosted the invaders in his city for six months until they became violent, started a war, and then murdered him. After which, they then set about assassinating his reputation, and it has yet to recover. And that brings me into the fourth point. The supposed prophecy was a later invention, a merging of the Mesoamerican mythology of Quetzalcoatl with the Christian mythology of the second coming. And, you know, as a sidebar, I found this, this idea that um, Montezuma believed that Cortez's arrival was prophesied. For some reason, I found it more deeply rooted in Britain than in the United States. Um, and... For a while, I was quoting the catalog of this wonderful exhibit that was at the British Museum um, on the Aztecs, uh, which was the, and that was, you know, this was uh, early 2000s. So it was, you know, 21st century bold statement is absolute fact that, that Montezuma was, his big mistake was he superstitiously believed this prophecy and so on. Um, so it, it, it is very much still deeply rooted in, in De La Rosa. I'm not quite sure why in Britain. I suspect there's a couple of key publications by British um, scholars that, had to, that kind of resonated more. Um, but it might, there might be something deeper and darker to do with the British Empire. I don't know. Anyway, in Mexico, as in other regions of the Americas, the invaders not only wrote the history of the conquest, 
but they also rewrote the indigenous past and reinvented indigenous cultures, all with a view to lending support to their justificatory narrative of conquest and colonization. With the Franciscans and other mendicant orders playing central roles in that project, millenarianism was weaved into the indigenous past, distorting its understanding all the way through to the 21st century. So when you see something that's being presented to you as being somehow a, a kind of a pure um, recounting of some aspect of the Mesoamerican past, Maya culture, Aztec culture, something like that. And it's, there seems to be kind of some weird sort of echo of something that also sounds familiar in another way, like the second coming of Christ. Um, I'd suggest to you that that is not coincidental. Um, and you should also know that there are lots of scholars who will argue with me about that, right? Saying, no, 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 it's coincidental. Um, point five, this was about resistance and rebellion. Um, so far, point five, Aztec resistance was just that, resistance to invasion, to a war that stretched from 1519, not just to 21, but in the greater Mexico all the way through the 1540s, with Spanish claims of rebellion serving as legalistic justifications for the slaughter of tens of thousands and the enslavement of hundreds of thousands of Nahuas and other Mesoamericans. So, Two counter arguments are important here. The first is that indigenous rulers acted according to their understanding of the Spanish threat. Montezuma hosting a couple of hundred Spaniards in Tenochtitlan for six months was far from a surrender. It was a reflection of his power and his intellectual curiosity. And such rulers acted according to their perception of the interests of their own people. Even if that meant attacking other indigenous groups, for example, Nahua warriors from Tlaxcala, depicted here in a, in a Nahua, in a Tlaxcalan account, or from former Aztec city-states, made possible Spanish colonies in the Maya world. Second counterpoint here, rebellion and revolt, these are in, in quotes, are coded colonialist terms that turn justified and legitimate resistance to invasion into illegal acts. I read something recently, uh, and I don't remember the, the details, doesn't matter, you probably, some of you will know better, but something similar to do with how language is being used right now in the Ukraine, in the, in the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Under Spanish law, those terms also provided a loophole in the prohibitions against the enslavement of indigenous people, a loophole through which conquistadors sailed ships carrying hundreds of thousands of indigenous families. The sixth point was on, was on sacrifice, so-called human sacrifice. Aztec civilization was, in fact, despite what people believe all through the early modern period, these are images from the 17th, 18th century, and, for, and you can see one German, German, one in French. Aztec civilization was, in fact, no more bloodthirsty than that of Spain and Europe, arguably less so, with human sacrifice that phrase, a prejudicial colonialist, and I would push that argument further to say, call its use today neo-colonialist, even possibly racist category, that disguised the fact that ritual executions in the Aztec world took different forms, but were conceptually similar to and no more widespread than those in the contemporaneous Iberian world, or for that matter, in Britain. You know, we talk about the perception in the United States of Elizabethan England is just being all about Shakespeare. And then people are shocked to learn that people were burned alive publicly at the stake for being Protestants or being Catholics earlier in the, in the same time period. And then you compare what that experience is like and, and how that is a form of public religious political execution that you could call human sacrifice. You can compare that to what the Aztecs did, which was far less in many respects. And you know, you, you start to see how this kind of image crumbles. One of the great acts of violence against indigenous cultures has been the European obsession with sacrifice, above all so-called human sacrifice, as a trope that exoticizes and exaggerates indigenous violence. From popular perceptions, movies, video games, even children's books, to mainstream scholarship, 
this deeply colonialist notion continues to distort and damage our grasp of the indigenous past and our respect for the indigenous present. With respect to the Maya, for example, there's no evidence whatsoever that cannibalism was practiced, but there's clear evidence of Spaniards imagining and inventing the idea. And while Mayas waged war sometimes brutally and they ritually executed captives and criminals, they did so no more than any other human society, and I would argue less so than 16th century Spaniards. To characterize such acts of violence in Maya history as human sacrifice is to disguise prejudicial and bigoted speculation as scholarly analysis, no different in effect from the colonialist methods of the Franciscans and others who sought to study Maya Aztec and Inca cultures in order to denigrate, destroy, and replace them. That's pretty rhetorical, but I hope I'm kind of making the point with a little, you know, with a drum roll. Um, and that rolls us into seven, where I talked about Tlaxcala, but there's a larger point here. So the truth is that Tlaxcala's form of government was the same as in all Nahua city states and towns, both those within and outside the Aztec Empire with its republicanism and first to convert status part of a colonial era micro-patriotic myth. Now, what's the larger context here? Central to the European perception of indigenous Americans, beginning with Columbus and rooted in medieval views of non-Christians was the idea that there were good Indians and bad Indians. That simple duality was apparently well evidenced in the Caribbean where the supposedly docile Arawaks were contrasted with the cannibalistic Caribs, right? And, and this, is an, this is ethnogenesis on the part of Europeans, right? They're, kind of in, they're inventing these ethnic categories as well as their attributes. It also surfaced on the mainland where certain indigenous peoples, um, the British like to use the colonialist term tribes, that's used less, less here, but um, anyway, they were labeled as good or bad, civilized or barbaric, easy to colonize or intransigent. The myth of Tlaxcal and exceptionalism is an expression of this false duality. Um, getting towards the end now on eight, back to Malinche. So Malinche, um, the truth here is really grim. You know, no wonder people love the romance idea because the, re the reality is just is, is absolutely horrific. So far from a romantic figure, she was a girl of 12 or 13 when she was acquired by the Spanish invaders. And she's best understood as one of tens, perhaps hundreds of thousands of indigenous girls forced into the transatlantic traffic in slaves. There's a, I don't really like the term sex slaves. Um, but so I put it in inverted commas, but until I can think of a better way to put that, that's what they were. And this trade stretches from the 1490s right through into the 17th century. She was far from being in, unique as a victim of that trade, just as Cortez was far from being a unique as a rapist of indigenous minors. That sounds like a like really putting it rhetorically, but um, it's really hard to escape the simple accuracy of that of that tag there was no cortez malinche romance she was a victim of child abuse giving birth to cortez's child nine months after she ceased to be useful as an interpreter when she was then passed on given to another spaniard she was still a teenager this is a statue of cortez and malinche with their child um, in mexico city the statue was um, you know, controversial in Mexico and was attacked. And so it was moved to an obscure corner in a park from where somebody stole um, the child and no one knows where it is or something kind of symbolic in that. When, the, when, the, when he was just a boy, Cortes took him away from his mother and sent him to Spain to be a page at the, at the court of the King of Spain. Um, Malinche never saw her son again. By the time he came back to Mexico, she was dead. And when he comes back to Mexico, he's accused of rebellion and is tortured. He's waterboarded and put on the rack and he spends the rest of his life crippled. The whole story is just grim. It just gets grimmer and grimmer, right? Um, the romanticization of the Cortez Malinche story is therefore kind of a, a hideous, grotesque distortion 
of a grim, oft ignored, oft ignored history. I stopped talking because my PowerPoint is frozen, which means I probably put in an image that was too high in resolution. Try that. There we go. Um, even its parody reflects a deeper unwillingness to accept this dark truth. Netflix, and here I put that red arrow in so that people would see how this was the love story of Malinche and Anquitez. The larger context to this point relates to the gendering of the conquest. Powerful, irresistible men, as I put it earlier, did not seduce the indigenous world with civilization. They subjected the indigenous world to systematic abuse. But that idea was readily embraced by Europeans in the centuries when their empires dominated the globe from the era of Columbus and Vespucci. This is an image often reproduced. That's supposed to be, that's Vespucci on the left holding the symbols of his technological superiority, right? And that, and the naked woman in the hammock represents America. America as an indigenous woman, often sexualized, is absolutely everywhere and it spreads and spreads all through the early modern period. And that example on the left, you won't recognize it, but Americans immediately do. She's on top of the US Capitol building. So every year that millions and millions of Americans to go visit, visit that building, that's what they see at the top there. That is, that is America as an indigenous woman. Um, now she's no longer called that. She's called, you'll, and you'll love this, armed freedom. But she's part of a tradition that, that, that we can see here. And in fact, when you go inside the Capitol building, um, there are many examples depicted inside of America um, who looks more traditionally like this as sort of some kind of topless non-European woman. And at the same time, you also see um, this image that is representing on the left, that's Malinche, and on the right, that's, that's Pocahontas, but of course, there's something much bigger going on here, right? This is in this is a gendered view of conquest um, as a kind of a romance, as a kind of a submission. Um, it's a sort of the larger context to what's gone wrong with the with the way in which we see Malinche. So when I talk about Malinche, there's very specific things to do with her life, but I think we really have to kind of blow that subject up to 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 see it differently. Okay, um, almost at the end, ninth. This was the point about superiority. And I don't think there's really a lot to say here. And I kind of jumped the gun when I introduced it earlier. So I think Spain and the West just are not objectively superior to indigenous America and nor did the West enjoy cultural advantages um, with differences in material culture that helped to explain, they might explain the Spanish presence, but not their superiority. I, I think I kind of dealt with that one. And then um, finally, uh, this is kind of a, a jumbly closing last slide, the last point, number 10. So in Mexico, 1521 marks not the end of the conquest, but its beginning. As the invasion wars continued through the 1540s, and only over many generations was the Aztec Empire slowly turned into New Spain, with the collaboration of Christianized indigenous leaders and their maintenance of significant regional autonomy. So there's kind of a lot in there, but what am I really saying is, in other words, the traditional dividing line between the time periods, pre-Columbian, conquest, colonial, modern, those are all colonialist in conception and aim. So the logic of decolonizing them means we must see indigenous responses to the Spanish invasions in the temporal context of the centuries before and after the likes of Columbus and Cortez. And that means rethinking the very disciplines of thought and education upon which we rely, including all the ones that you are, you know, at Oxford, you read, right? Art history, archaeology, anthropology, and yes, history. So to decolonize the conquistadors, we have to decolonize history with a capital H. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Restel. That was re that was a brilliant talk. Uh, I feel like I should kick things off with with, the, with questions. I do have one question, which is, I when you mentioned the horrible histories, I, I I actually have the box set at home, so I immediately knew what you were talking about, and I'm like, oh yes, I there was a lot of problematic things in the book and the TV in the TV adaptation, of course, and I was just wondering, what are your thoughts on how we can better uh, shift uh, pop culture like how we can like perhaps shift popular perceptions of the indigenous peoples of not only the mesoamerica but like the americas in general away from this sort of very lurid and uh prurient view of like oh look at these people who rip out people's hearts and let's focus on tlaloc or whatever and like you know all that sort of stuff because that's how i was that's how i was taught and of course you know it's it's a bit it's it's a lot of work getting to unlearn that so how do we mm -hmm. should we as a like how, how what would you recommend for like pop, to move popular perceptions away towards a more balanced like view of these indigenous peoples you know i think i i mentioned i i kind of throw out there i say things like oh video games and blah 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 um as if that's all kind of part of the problem um but you know in a longer talk or a longer discussion um it's important to emphasize that they those things are also part of the solution and and that um you know i sometimes tend to assume that your generation are behaving the same way that previous generations have which is um you you go to the authorities right you know who well who's who's the leading authority in this and then you've got some you know professor teacher tutor whoever it is who says well this is the person you know this is the guy and then you stop right there and i think that that um that kind of privileging of you know a book written by somebody like me um has been undermined uh in the last 30 years by the kind of cultural shift and i'm, I'm making it sound like it's a bad thing no it's a totally a good thing so i have i get emails from uh, people making video games in in mexico and in japan who um say okay we read your book um, and I'm like, okay, that's don't base your video games on my books. And they say, no, 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 we, we read your book and we want to know more. Like we get that what you're trying to do is question things. And we want to kind of question even more than that. And they say, we're not, we're not saying that you haven't, you know, they try to be very respectful. And it's like, okay, just come out and say it. What you're saying is I'm only just started doing this process. There's so much more that can be done. Right. And they're like, well, we think there might be. So what do we, how do we do that? What do we do? Right because we want to make video games um, that reflect our generation's view of this, but we just don't know what that is. All we know is we don't want it to be the same as the previous generations, right? So, you know, I, 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 I mean, I, I kind of bag on that horrible histories as textbook. It's a little unfair in that I actually have gone through and looked at different editions of that book in detail. And I can see that there's been an attempt over time to respond to scholarly changes and perceptions. But yeah, I, you know how I'm many sorry, horrible yeah. histories there are? I mean, they'd have to be selling many, many millions of more copies to employ, like all of you guys, right? Full time reading mountains of literature in order to master every field to say, okay, in the study of you know, the Napoleonic Wars on the study of whatever it is, this is the latest idea right here. Now you've got to change the cartoons and so on. So I can see they are they are making an effort. And that is exactly what it is about. It's like each, you know, imagine a horrible history is each, you know, five years, ideally that gets redone, redone. And then eventually they realize you can't call it angry Aztecs. And you now it alliterates nicely. The cartoon is funny but you have to engage the reason why it's funny the assumption that they can quite reasonably make that everybody who sees that goes oh yeah that's funny because of course that's what the aztecs were all about that's what they did right they ripped out the heart and the, the whole thing that's like kind of the centerpiece of their do you want to do that that's fine then elizabethan england has to be a picture of somebody being burned alive at the stake then yeah, now now we're getting to some kind of parity right I think that 
I, 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 I will say this. I think that just before uh, the other questions happen, uh, I will say that in all fairness, I, I, I do remember that they were very focused on like the horrible bits of history obviously so like even victorian england they were focusing a lot on like child labor and i think that was the first time as a child that was like oh my god that was awful like well i would never want to live back then but like uh yeah but the obviously the tv show was a bit problematic because it shows how much attitudes have changed even in the last decade because they they were getting white actors in brown face essentially and mm -hmm. i was looking at that and i didn't realize anything was wrong as a child but as which is weird because i'm like a person of color but like i look at that now and i'm like yikes that's i don't know how anyone signed off on that even in 2010 or whatever and like you know obviously that wouldn't happen now so like you know there's a shift in attitudes but yeah yes, thank I, you for yeah i totally agree you know and i i feel very i feel so much more optimistic about you know what you're what you're talking about enzo you know how this gets changed than i than i did 10 years ago and that's from you know talking to people like you people like you i mean like students students at penn state students at oxford students wherever i i have lots of these conversations and you know sometimes i think oh maybe i'm just banging away in the the wrong thing like am i preaching to the converted here you know and then i pick up a new brand new book you know by a an accomplished scholar and it's like the same old stuff is in there again i go okay no i'll just keep banging away and then you know it'll be you enzo or jacob you know 20, 30 years from now, like, you know, sort of carrying that, that torch, and then you'll be seen old, as old fashioned, and you know, you'll be corrected and so on. That it has to be this continual kind of process. Are there other questions? You, we have for another five minutes, right? Morgan. Yes, thank you so much. So that was a fantastic talk. Um, and it's funny that the topic of your of this talk is really something that is even a, a sort of something that I was questioning today when I was reading uh, a book about uh, the, the conquest of Colombia. And this word conquest is it's everywhere in the literature. And like you said in, in the talk that the term conquest privileges this this classic perspective, the narrative of the Spanish invaders and you know, in my own papers uh, throughout, you know, sort of like my academic career, I'm constantly using this term. And so what, in your opinion, would be sort of a better term to use? And I know that's- I know it's hard. And the terminology thing, it's, it's both really important. And at the same time, you know, one has this kind of like, let's just move on from it. Let's just accept some terms we have to use, right? That some we can't get around. Um, I, I think in, I noticed at some point in my own work that I had been using conquest without thinking about it. And then the a book I published in 2005, which I that was one of the covers that came up, it's called Invading Guatemala. And it was actually coming up with the title of the book that made me realize, because I, I was like, I don't, I don't want to call it the conquest of Guatemala. I'm going to call it invade. And then I thought, I don't want to use that word at all. Right. And so I started using invasion as a as a as a as a kind of another term, um, and I, you know I is that the best term? I don't know. As long as people are talking about it, right? As long as someone's coming along saying, "Well, I don't like Restall's invasion. I think we should do something else." Then I'm happy, right? Because it means that there's a discussion. And we are, is there a perfect alternative term? No, probably not. But as long as we're not, as long as we understand that. Um, it's not okay just to sort of talk about Indians, right? It's not okay just to talk about, I like the, 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 like now there's um, a, a kind of a shift that's taking place very quickly about talking about slaves so that we don't talk about slaves, we talk about enslaved peoples and so on. And I've had discussions with people like, does it really make that much difference? And they're saying, well, it's that's not really the point. The point is that we're talking about it and why, because it's then it opens a door to thinking more creatively about the experience of people who are put in that category, right? And so it just, it leads in so many other directions. Um, I also have been coming up with, but possibly eventually people would say, these are kind of rather silly things where like the Aztec Spanish war, there's this, there's a, there's a Spanish Maya 30 years war that I've been talking about because like there was no conquest of the Maya, right? There wasn't a conquest of Yucatan. Um, this is whole problem. These are really problematic concepts. So how do we talk about that? Well, I noticed the first time Spaniards and Mayas are battling on a beach, full scale battle is 1517. 
And the last time there appears to be that kind of conflict is 1547. I mean, there's more later. There's 150 years later, there's another invasion of a Maya kingdom. But, and it's a nice, tidy 30 years. And I thought, oh, everything is so Eurocentric in our profession, right? That the 30 years war, no one's, it's not the European 30 years war, it's just the 30 years war. So to have a Spanish Maya 30 years war kind of somehow taps into that and inverts it a little bit and even then, at conferences, people have said, shouldn't it be the Maya-Spanish 30 years war if you're really trying to be progressive? And I, and I just laugh. I'm like, you know what? That's fine either way. Just as long as we're talking about it and discussing it, then, then, we, then we're getting somewhere, right? I, I, would, I would say, Morgan, don't be afraid to question any, any term at all. But at the same time, try not to be dogmatic and stubborn about a brilliant term that you think you've come up with <laughs> you might you know <laughs> you might come up with a brilliant one um but uh, but don't you know don't worry if ever with people are like uh, you know are, are questioning it All right thank you thanks so much professor we have um i'm conscious we're uh we're at, the, at our, um, our time now but there there is one more question in the chat if you um in the chat you will Oh, yes. Yes, I did see that from Mary. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I get asked that often, especially when I'm talking a lot about Mexico, can we do new conquest history? Um, yeah, I mean, yes, of course, the answer has to always be yes, you can there can there can be a revisionist history, new conquest history, any region of the Americas. And if the indigenous peoples in that region, either did not have a writing tradition, all the writing tradition they had did not translate into them writing in their own language. You can still access their voice, right? It, it, it might be harder, but you can still do it. I mean, just think of that example of the of Montezuma's nephew writing in Latin. Um, it's not so much about the language, it's about the authorship and the purpose and how we kind of read through those. Um, so the fact that we don't have Mapundung, I don't know how to say Mapuche language, Mapudungun, um, uh, language sources should not be seen as like oh no we can't do it i don't i don't think so um and then someone's saying they have a catch a class that's awesome um but i love that there are people watching this that are going off to learn catch that's brilliant thank you so much for inviting me thank you for your attention everybody and your questions um please don't hesitate if you have a question but you've got to rush off to class or you didn't know how to phrase it or whatever, please don't hesitate to email me. I'm very easily found on email. And I'm, I'm happy to, um, to answer questions by email. So thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, um, for your time um, and, and a brilliant talk. We, we really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for, uh, for joining us. Cheers, we'll be ending the, uh, the Zoom now. Thank you so much. Bye guys, thank you, bye.